Hi, everyone. Juliana Forlano here. This is Act Now. Thanks for joining me today. Thanks for letting me join you wherever you are. Well, um, for me, the top story has been uh, the tornadoes and the, uh, as Fox News would put it, the unseasonably unusual weather. What do they call it? They call it the uh, unseasonal extreme weather. Um, I've been following the coverage. I've been noticing the sort of sotto voce messaging that's been going on, both from, you know, right wing media, which is really it's not sotto voce. It's it's full voce uh, on, on right wing media. Uh, on the left, it's a little bit more subtle. And um, in media that is, quote unquote, supposed to be just your average weather reporting, there's a misleading nature uh, to neutral reporting as well. We're going to cover all of that in our first segment, which is the headlines. And then after that, Jocelyn McCurdy Keats is going to be joining us. She has been looking into cl the climate anxiety that young people are feeling. Now, I hope I'm still included in young people, but I, you know, what is maybe old people aren't feeling it because they're like, oh, we're going to die anyway. It's fine. I don't know. I feel like if you're awake and paying attention, um, I think. I think we all have uh, concerns about the livability of this planet. Anxiety for me does not cover it. I believe it's closer to existential terror. <laughs> so how do we live with that? How do we deal with that? What is mental health under these conditions? We're going to talk about that in the second half of the show. Stay tuned. Don't forget to share us. And uh, I got to comments right over here. John Carlos in the background. He's going to read me all the comments that aren't just like nutty right wing people. I will entertain right wing comments as long as they're respectful um, and reasonable. So probably there won't be any. Ah, anyway, uh, thanks for watching. Stay tuned for the headlines. Hey, everybody. Thanks for watching. So uh, this is a segment I like to call Democracy Dies in Bullshit. Uh, for, uh, let's just get right into the reporting that's been happening on the tornadoes that happened in Kentucky and some of those other uh, climate denying states um, <laughs> down south. It was obviously, you know, I don't have to report to you about the enormous amount of destruction. It took them several days to be able to figure out exactly what force tornado it was. And I believe at this point they're saying it is an EF5, which is the highest level of tornado um, that you can have, probably because there is no EF6 or EF7. It's just like, that's it. I wonder if they're going to have to expand the definition because this was so unprecedented, so historical that um, they they even really found, found it difficult to talk about. Uh, let's start with our first image, Giancarlo. As I was reading, I read through, you know, some papers of note here in the United States and abroad. I, I went to the Democracy Dies in Darkness Washington Post and the Guardian. OK, so the Guardian, obviously, Biden calls on EPA to investigate role of climate crisis in the deadly tornadoes. That's a nice title, if you ask me. It's very to the point. It gives him some credit. Unfortunately, the time for studies are over. And I think just saying that we're going to investigate. Uh, investigation is done. It's called, I mean, I'm not a climate scientist, but I play one on Act TV. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it's over. The time for, for studies is is over. I mean, we can study how much and why, uh, what they're coming. It's, it's like I'm getting these disparate studies. On the Weather Channel, they're saying how the Gulf of Mexico is one degree warmer than it's ever been at this time of year, ever been ever. One degree of warming means there's more energy in the air above the Gulf of Mexico. And um, that means there, there's more energy, there's more water vapor in the air, and it can cause stronger storms. I am a social worker and I know that much about science, <laughs> this kind of science. So it's it's really disturbing that this isn't rote news. Um, but even worse is how the Washington Post, po Post reported it, I think. Biden walks a careful line on climate after tornadoes. That is infuriating 
to people on the left. And I continue to watch the Washington Post so discontent with Biden. People, you can be discontent with Biden, but sowing discontent with the president who is, you know, it's very easy to watch Fox News so discontent among their, um, you know, their base. And their base, when they fight against the discontent that they see, the things they're discontent about, they're trying to bring on fascism. When Democrats, even progressives, or people on the left, not the corporate ones, but the people on the left, get discontent with the president that they have, that they could push, that they could try to continue to push. I mean, he has turned out to be more progressive than anyone could have imagined he would be, even though he is not satisfying um, you know, some of the things that uh, a lot of people would like, especially when it comes to climate change. When, when the left media... So is discontent. They so discontent among people uh, who who really uh, would would believe in a shared prosperity. Uh, so I think it's actually you know at least Fox News is lying out loud to your face and not pretending. <laughs> They're real obvious there. So um, an interesting part of this um, Guardian piece. We'll move on to the next image, Giancarlo. Um, the FEMA director, our FEMA director, on Sunday. At least they. Uh, at least they give it to you straight in the Guardian. Um, on Sunday, Deanne Criswell, she's the administrator for the Federal Emergency Management Agency, and this is reported right out of that article I pulled out of FEMA, was asked in a CNN interview if she thought the climate crisis intensified the power of the tornado that traveled more than 200 miles. Now, I expected the next line to be, um, obviously, but what she said is, I think... It, the incident, is incredibly unusual. We do see tornadoes in December. That part is not unusual. But at this magnitude, I don't think we've ever seen one this late in the year. Well, as it turns out, oh, uh, sorry. Then she goes on to say, but it's also historic. The severity and the amount of time this tornado or these tornadoes spend on the ground is unprecedented. Okay, so not only is it unprecedented at this time of year, it's unprecedented across history. There have been two others, I believe one was in 1958, and it certainly wasn't as long. It was just an EF5. That's it. So these are unprecedented climate events, excuse me, weather events, obviously linked into what we're living in climate chaos. It's just, it's, it's, I find it very disturbing that they can't just come out and say, oh, yeah, it's climate change. This is part of climate chaos. I mean, where's Al Gore? Can they ask Al Gore? The woman then added more generally on extreme weather, as if that wasn't general enough, this is going to be our new normal. And the effects that we're seeing from climate change are the crisis of our generation. Well, you know, I have to say, I believe this idea, this... Um, this languaging of this is the new normal suggests that we should all just get used to it and not fight it. Um, there are a lot of forces, and I'm going to get into them later, especially religious forces who are suggesting that we don't fight what's going on. Meanwhile, later in the segment, we're going to show that when Jocelyn comes on, that solidarity and pushing for the most humane solution is what's going to keep you mentally sane during these times but i don't want to i don't want to telescope what we're talking about in the second half but anyway i don't think we should be talking about this as if it's the new normal oh it's the it's just the new normal that any day now my whole house and me could be lifted up off the ground and tossed about they're reporting that um debris was uh, found 30,000 feet in the air. I don't know if it was found or that it was measured to have gone up or seen or whatever, 30,000 feet in the air. And when they say debris, they could mean anything from enormous projectiles of cars to smaller debris uh, to human bodies. You know, we're talking about a very intense event that people have gone through. Um, I think it would be important I mean, you're seeing like a lot of over flyover shots, John Carlo. Do we have a, one of the? There's so many flyover shots that we they're showing, but I, I really think it's important to get on the ground and show. Thanks. This is uh, from Gavin Newsom. We're going to talk about that in a sec. Um, you know, just flyover shots of destruction. I think it's important to get down to the actual level of 
um, the nitty gritty of what we're seeing here. Uh, people have to be able to see themselves in the in the shoes of the people who this happened to. Everyone says it's oh, it's not going to happen here. Oh, wildfires, that's in California, especially the people we would like to start getting on board with this. <clears throat> Gavin Newsom from California. The people of Kentucky are waking up. This is a tweet. Uh, the people of Kentucky are waking up to absolute devastation this morning. Our hearts are with them and the states across the central U.S. that were impacted by this terrible tragedy. California stands at the ready to aid and assist with any response and recovery. That is very magnanimous of California. I do not remember Mitch McConnell of Kentucky, who, by the way, in his floor speech yesterday, did not mention climate change at all. That's to be expected from him. I don't remember when when California was on fire having the state of Kentucky offer to send help. <laughs> I don't think they did. In fact, you know, my lesser nature was like, why should you do that, California? They would see you burn, okay? You can yell at me in the comments. I'm trying to stay in my, in my higher nature for this. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's a good, it's a good question. It's, it's, it's a, that's a whole nother show. How can you be a person of conscience and still go high while the other people go lower as the Obama administration said they were going to do uh, when they, I think they said when they go low, we go higher, right? It's a, it's a good idea until they gun you down. Anyway, next slide, Giancarlo, we're, my, my GC in the back. He's fabulous. Also, I just wanted to say that Gavin Newsom he texted, this is on a separate issue. We're going to come back, but uh, it, it it bears pointing out. Um, <laughs> he made a big deal and a splash when he said, and if you can't read, I'll read it for you. Um, SCOTUS is letting private citizens in Texas sue to stop abortion? Question mark, exclamation point. If that's the president, if that's the precedent, then we can let all Californians sue those who put ghost guns and assault weapons on our streets. If Texas can ban abortion and endanger lives, California can ban deadly weapons of war and save lives. Pretty great. Ooh, I haven't seen a Democrat show some coljones like that in quite some time. That's very interesting. Of course, the NRA shows up and they go absolutely ballistic put out a big red tweet with big red big red the color of blood actually which i think is fitting uh nra says the nra statement on newsom's political gun control stunt get governor newsom misunderstands the actions of the supreme court um and the limits of his war on lawful gun ownership his promise to run roughshod over the Second Amendment is little more than political theater. Well, while these NRA people would be happy to run roughshod over um, precedent in our Supreme Court. Mm, interesting. Yeah, I like it. He woke up the beast, right, by saying this. This excites me very much. Um, yeah, I guess I'll keep my eye on what he's doing. What are your thoughts? Put them in the comments and Giancarlo will read them to me if they're not absolutely horrendous. <laughs> all right. <laughs> I can see him in the background like, no, nope, no, nope. it's all horrible. <laughs> Do not. Okay. Yeah. Last week we actually caught the eye of some right wing trolls. And so there was a lot of right wing trolley comments that I took as a personal compliment. Like this person is liberal nut. <laughs> most people are just most people are just sharing their experiences. Um, what do you got there? What do you got, John Carl? Uh, Angel Maria uh, puts in chat: the tornado in o o Oklahoma back a few years ago swept for around a hundred miles or so. Does anybody remember that? Many people died. Also, we had earthquakes and tornadoes in the Northeast. Which I've been on Earth fifty-five years. I lived in the Northeast fifty-five years. I've never seen anything like it. Yeah. Yes. So I think we can all believe, thank you for those comments. I appreciate it. I, I think we can all believe, uh, you know, what we're seeing. I don't understand why we need a, a news media to be like, um, something's going on with the weather. <laughs> it's pretty obvious if you look outdoors. Um, 
Obviously, we're going to talk about this in a moment. The factory workers were threatened with being fired if they left before the tornado because there were warnings out. The employees say several actually died. There was quite a few injuries. There's capitalism for you. It's rough. It's no good. I don't even know what to say about this. It's just like it, it speaks for itself. Uh, I know candles are very, very, it's it's a high demand time for candles this time of year. Candles are what you get people that you don't really know that well, but you want to give them a gift and you figure candles, right? <laughs> In high demand. And people died because the, the company would not close down for one evening. What needs to be said? You can put it in the comments and John Carlo will read it. <laughs> All right. I'm going to move on to the next. Oh, actually, yeah. So, okay. Let's, I have, a, I have, I want to check in with what the right wing is doing. Uh, I have Brian Kilmeade uh, from Fox News. This is how he, uh, this is how they're putting it over there. They're talking about this being an extreme weather event. I am sorry to make you sit through him talking, but I did want to point out that his last name, Kilmeade, sounds so much like Kill Me, which is exactly how I feel after I listen to him. Here he is. Meanwhile, everyone's uh, immediately talking about climate change being the, the cause of this, which it really amazes me, is because I, to me, I, you can't explain every natural disaster and say, well, it's, this is about climate change. And the New York Post writes in their editorial today that there's no science that backs up a tornado in December is unlikely uh, and it's not usual, but it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with climate change. Wow. How interesting that they would pick up. Did he say the New York Post? He would pick up a, a, a newspaper written, uh, uh, owned by the same company that owns his channel and quote it as if that's a different newspaper, <laughs> as if that's a different propaganda organization. Wow. I mean, we must be really, really stupid to think. Anyway, yeah, there is science. Um, he also said something that's very misleading. You can't think every natural disaster is climate change. Yeah, but this one is a climate disaster. Okay, I'm not thinking that the volcanoes that are all going off in tandem, I'm thinking it's weird, but I'm not thinking that it's climate change because it's not about the climate. But this one is about the climate. In fact, Brian Kilmeade, the climate is a holistic system. It's not like one thing can happen that's related to climate change over here and something else can happen that's not related to climate change over here. Everything that happens in the climate has been touched by climate change because we're in the middle of it. That's it. There's no more. It's, you know, it's a zero sum issue. Okay. So Brian Kilmeade basically may, is making the point uh, without really saying the word Lord Jesus Christ that these reverends have been making across the board. And I've been doing a deep dive into the internet, which is... Anyway, uh, <laughs> I've been doing a deep dive into the internet and to what... Um, some religious organizations are how they're portraying this, what they're thinking about. And I've got Reverend Hagee. Um, we talked a little bit about him and his church and the history there last a couple of weeks ago because they were into some other malfeasance. But um, here he is. I think he really sums up um, the evangelical point of view on climate change. Let's take a listen. The weather events that are taking place in the world today are a result of environmental impact of global warming, that emissions from factories and sorts of things are the reason why there's mudslides and the reason why there's uh, hurricanes and tornadoes uh. and earthquakes and all of these various situations. That's incorrect. The Bible says that whenever we approach the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, that there would be strange weather patterns. So we have a decision to make. Do we believe what an environmentalist group says and choose to live in a world where we're attempting to make everything as clean in the air as possible? Or do we believe what the Bible says that these things were going to happen and that rather than try and clean up all of the air and solve all the problems of the world by eliminating factories, we should start to tell people about Jesus Christ who is to return. 
where do I start? <laughs> where do I start, John Carlo? I see you back there. All right. Um, so again, he did the exact same thing that obviously is in the right wing playbook where he says that earthquakes and mudslides are due to climate change. Well, mudslides may be secondary to climate change because if it rains so much that it destabilizes a mountain, then yes, a mudslide can be secondary to climate change. But they're making, you know, they're drawing these conclusions that that climate change scientists are definitely not drawing. We're not saying earthquakes are due to climate change. That's absolutely insane. And then he's got, well, if you ask the Bible, and I have to say, I'm not used to, um, I'm not used to being like, well, what does the Bible say about science? You know, <laughs> maybe some people are, and, you know, people do consult this. Oh, God. Juliana, um, yeah. creative experiments in chat said something pretty interesting. Climate change melts land-based ice reducing ice weight pressure on plate tectonics which causes earthquakes which also you know helps uh you know volcano eruptions and stuff like that so it's all it's all really connected it's not just you know i have heard that yes thank you for that i didn't you know i didn't feel um i'm glad you said that because i haven't i didn't feel uh steeped well enough in the knowledge about that plate tectonics issue but i have heard it and i didn't want to give any i didn't want to get any fuel to anyone on the right and i'm sure you know I'm sure that's not why they're saying it. They're not like, let's look at the science behind plate tectonics and then we'll, <laughs> they're not doing that. But yes, that's a very good point. And I thank you for making it. Um, the checking in with the Bible on science is just a highly unusual uh, thing for me to hear someone say, but God, I don't want to play it again, but I, I feel like, you know, what happens? Here's my question. I don't understand what Jesus, I don't even know. It, their logic doesn't even make sense in their own worldview to me. Was it like, and Jesus saith unto them, doeth nothing when lay thou could save thy brother from dying under a factory ceiling. You know, he's, they're basically saying, well, when Jesus comes, he said that the you know, the air was going to be dirty. So why should we clean it up? What if it stops him from coming? We want Jesus to come. We love Jesus. We can't wait to meet him just as much as my four-year-old can't wait to meet Santa Claus in a few weeks at the mall. We're very thrilled about Jesus. But what if Jesus comes and is not very happy with what you've been doing, like not cleaning up his world? Anyway, there's a lot of a priori arguments underneath that rant, like that, you know, but this is what they believe. And I think it's very important that that we talk about it uh, and, and we know about why they are unconvincible. Because the church has historically been a tool of oppression, economic oppression for poor people and people without means. I mean, it's insane. These people believe that in in uh, suffering is good because it means you get closer to Jesus. Like Mother Teresa had sick children alone and starving in her tents. Uh, according to Christopher Hitchens, by the way, remember, I missed that guy. Mother Teresa was not a friend to the poor. This is a quote by Hitchens. She was a friend of poverty. She said that suffering was a gift from God and that she spent her life opposing the only cure for poverty, which is the empowerment of women and the emancipation of them, by the way, from, oh, you know, a livestock version of compulsory reproduction. Uh, many more people are poor and sick because of the life of Mother Teresa, by the way. Even more will be poor and sick if her example is followed. She was an absolute fanatic, a fundamentalist, fraud. Insane. Mother Teresa opposed contraception and abortion. She was just and still is the enemy of women's rights. And so she's been championed, you know, uh, she's become the Excalibur for the Catholic Church's war on women. There's this idea of suffering for Jesus. You know, she allowed suffering in her institutions with such depressing regularity that one would assume she was sure suffering in the name of Jesus was a good thing. Insane. Okay. 
Uh, she is saturated, basically, with a primitive fundamentalist religious worldview that sees pain and hardship and suffering as an ennobling experience and a beautiful expression of, uh, you know, affiliation with Jesus. I don't get that. Can't you have a beautiful expression of affiliation with Jesus by enjoying the creations of God? <laughs> I don't get it. Oh. Hitchens also reported um, that in an interview with Mother Teresa, she herself talks about a patient suffering unbearable pain from terminal cancer that was in her um, care. And with a smile, she told the camera what she told the patient. You are suffering like Christ on the cross. Jesus must be kissing you. And apparently, <laughs> unaware of that response, the sufferer uh, said, you know, uh, then please tell him to stop kissing me. <laughs> oh, anyway. Well-meaning people donated money to Mother Teresa, we'll remember, and her organization, and they thought they were helping people, but the donations often went to help Mother Teresa's order of nuns hurt people rather than help them. Hundreds of hours of research was done, and a lot of it was, um, I don't know if you heard about this, cataloged in a book published in 20. 2003. And we're talking about climate change. We're talking about the attitude that underlies why so many religious right folks do not, do not care to believe in climate change. Uh, there, there was found a cult and, and Mother Teresa actually brings out this, this um, thought system perfectly, this, this cult of suffering and that was in the homes run by Mother Teresa's organization, which was called the Missionaries of Charity. There were children tied to beds with little or no comfort to dying patients, except maybe some aspirin. They, This researcher said that Mother Teresa took her um, adherence to frugality and simplicity to extremes, allowing practices like the reuse of hypodermic needles and tolerating primitive facilities that required the patients to defecate in front of each other. Meanwhile, they had the money to not have that happen. You know, Western audiences didn't care about whether a third world city's dignity or prestige had been hampered by an Albanian nun, said the researcher. So obviously they may be interested in the lies and charlatans and frauds that are going on there. Very interested. And, you know, the Catholic Church is making her a saint. And they believe that that's okay. They believe in the suffering. So that's where we are. I have story after story after story, but just reading them to you is kind of making me sick. We're talking from these churches, thousands of years of disempowerment programming that the adherents have gone through. The sheeple. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, and people who believe this are really in full flight from reality. So talking about mental health with Jocelyn, who's coming on the program in a brief moment, how do we have mental health as we see the end of our civilization coming up with half of the civil half of the people we have to share the content a continent with um being in full flight from reality and some of them even um looking forward to more destruction because they believe it brings them closer to Jesus don't know it's going to be rough this is i don't want to forget anything that i prepared for you but this reminds me of the story when i saw um the pope pope francis who uh got to say pope francis out there going you know, we should probably take care of each other and climate change is a thing. And, you know, maybe we don't want to let our democracy slide into fascism. <laughs> okay. it's a lot to say about that. You can put it in the comments and Giancarlo will read them for me. But uh, I, I went to see the Pope when he came to um, New York City. He was in here, I have a picture of it. John Carl is going to put it up in a second. I have a picture of when I, this is from the media, but I went and I was standing not too far from where this picture was taken. As you'll see, there are hordes and hordes of people there. There were hundreds of thousands, I would imagine, of people there. The entire park was shoulder to shoulder. And um, it was such an interesting experience. We got there very early, stood there all day, and the Pope came through on this little Pope mobile you see here, bulletproof, because, hey, you never know. Um, and the people that were standing around me, most of them were there with like prayer cards, um, pictures of 
um, people, they wanted intercession from the Pope. They wanted the Pope's special popely powers to ask God for a special favor to cure this sick person. And I'm thinking, if all of these people would just show up for Medicare for all, for a rally for that, we would not need to bring pictures of the Pope, you know, pictures to the Pope in his one swing through town to hope that maybe somehow this person could get the kind of care that they deserve and, and, and be healed through the miracle of modern science. <laughs> you know, I'm not saying don't believe in some sort of spiritual healing that could work too, but let science work. Just, I'm getting tired of having to share the planet with people who are out of their freaking minds. Any who's with me anyway, my final thought. So I've talked about what the right did as they cover climate change, which is totally expected. But, you know, I just wanted to point out so that we're all aware of how intermingled it is with this um, Jesus is coming soon. Let the apocalypse reign. We're not going to do anything to help our brother or sister or child because Jesus. Um, I'm not really sure how we're going to deal with that. You can put that what you think in the comments. And I, I dealt with the, the left and how they're like, well, Biden has said he's going to commission a study, which makes people even more mad. We certainly would like him to come out and say, um, obviously, can't we just quote the scientists who are saying, um, obviously, this has to do with climate change? I just said that so you can quote me. But also, and this is the final piece that I want to say. John Carl, get ready to play the audio, okay? That that I pulled out some audio from a WNYC's morning edition that was played uh, today when I said, Alexa, please play a morning edition, uh, WNYC. WNYC is a national public radio station, affiliate station in New York City, if you, if you didn't know. Um, yeah, National Petroleum Radio, some call it. There's a, I, I look through the list of donors, a lot of a lot of big donors from insurance companies, a lot of big donors from oil and gas, you know, mo most of the money for NPR actually is uh, privately donated. Only 10% um, comes from uh, federal or state subsidies. So keep that in mind. National public radio is actually national private radio. National corporate radio, maybe they just change the name. But they try to do what's considered neutral reporting, right? They just give you the facts. And I think they should do their neutral reporting a little bit differently. Here is the weather report, the literal re weather report um, that they played today. Your forecast now, sunny with a high near 52 today, partly cloudy with a low around 37, and then cold tonight, mostly cloudy and partly cloudy, low around 37, as we said, and then mostly cloudy and 52 tomorrow, 46 and sunny now. I mean, the guy cracks me up because he's just like, it's going to be 57 degrees today, mostly cloudy. They should fix this. Anyone doing weather anywhere should have to put what it normally is this time of year. It's 57 degrees outside. Normal high should be around 39. So enjoy this unseasonably warm, beautiful day before all the climate chaos leaves you homeless. This is WNYC. Cold tonight, low around 37, which is normal for this time of year in this latitude. So we've got that going for us. You know, things like that. If you report insane things as natural, as new, with a neutral voice, you are making it the new normal, back to what I said at the top of the show, and you're just putting people back to sleep who might otherwise get up and try to save their own hide. I'm Juliana Forlano. You've been watching Act TV. Stay with me in the next segment. Jocelyn McCurdy Keats talks with me about um, how people are are dealing or not dealing or not being able to deal with everything that's happening as our climate continues to crumble around us and and what we can do to maintain our own mental health. Stay tuned. Hi, Jocelyn. 
Oh, girl, I can't hear a word you're saying. I am so sorry. That's okay. <laughs> hey, hey, how are you? How are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing good. I'm do I mean, you know, my house is still standing. I feel like uh, these days, uh, when you look around and you look at what's happening in the world, it's, you know, good, good becomes far more relative than it did in the past. It is very true, unfortunately. So yeah. you wanted to talk about a couple things here that you, you So I think that, uh, you know, unfortunately, this I think, so we know about all the climate disasters that we're dealing with in a very tangible way. But I think what's uh, so an organization known as Avaz, we've done lots of very cool work with them over the past year, paired up with the Lancet a surgical or they paired up with a bunch of world renowned psychologists and medical professionals to study the effect this is having on our mental health, specifically the, the mental health. Change. Wait, the effect right. that since this will be a separate segment on YouTube, we are the segment right before this, oh, we talked sorry. about <laughs> climate change and the catastrophes in light of the climate change driven tornadoes there. I said it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no one wants to say it. I mean, it's insane. Okay. Um, so <laughs> so yes. with that said, so the United Nations and all the scientists that go with that are telling us that we have about 10 years left of uh, to get off fossil fuels before we're facing extinction as a race, which is a terrifying thing to think about. And a bunch of medical professionals all over the world came together and decided to ask 10,000 young people from different countries in a representative study how this was impacting them at a psychological level. And it's tragic and terrifying to hear that climate anxiety and the belief that the human race might not continue long enough for this younger generation of a future is something that's experienced by 80% at some level with similar numbers feeling othered when they try to bring this up with adults in 65% feeling quite- Oh my God, I feel othered when I try to bring this up with adults right? and I am an adult. <laughs> so Did you ask the adults. I, I would like to know that. I would like to put my name in for the story. For the well, study. that's a that's a good question. And I mean, this study spelled dealt specifically with Generation Z. But I think that, you know, the premise of the study is that young people are feeling this in a more intimate way. But yeah, I think that there should be there should be a question of why are young people feeling this more than older generations and our older generations feeling this. Yeah. And why we, are young people? Why? That's a weird thing. I, you know, are young people feeling this more than older people? I don't think that's the case. I mean, as a, I mean, no one's caring because we're not out there in the street demanding that our future not be stolen from us. You know, that's, I, as a mom, I am more concerned now that I have a kid than I was when it was just me. Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, I guess that's it. I mean, I'm concerned about you, but I guess this isn't, there's not much we're going to be able to do. But once I had a daughter, it made me yeah. more crazy than I already yeah. was about it. Well, and it's, it's a really terrifying thing to hear from a global organ. I don't even, I mean, what do you call the United Nations, a global organization, a, a global government entity that we might be facing the end of the human race unless we govern differently. But most young people seem to feel that not only is that not happening, but governments are lying about what's happening. And that injects a real daily measurable difference into the way they live their lives and the way say like, you know, maybe we did at that age. What, what are, what are the differences that are, be, that they're seeing? Just increased levels of anxiety and uh, feeling. Are they like unwilling to like, you know what, I'm not, why would I go to college? What's the point? Or are well, they? Yeah. 40% say they don't want to have children because of this, because what's the point, which, you know, is something that I think, you know, it's a really complicated topic because you can't blame literally anyone for feeling that way. But then there's the obvious question of that, okay, see, that's actually a, a kind and compassionate thing to think. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that's a, it's unfortunate that kindness and compassion toward unborn the, you know, future generations toward your own offspring um, mm -hmm. has to do with not bringing them into the world, but that is, a show of, of kindness and consideration. Meanwhile, there are people out there just plopping them out. <laughs> I hate to say that, but every time someone tells me they're like, I'm pregnant. I'm like, have you been reading? <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I just, it seems like that is the same 
response? Yeah. Well, and then, you know, the question then becomes, okay, so do we just not continue the human experiment (laughs) or do we try to push for saner governing? And I hope it's a little bit of the latter, (laughs) at least some of it, Uh, because I don't I I don't, you know, the way climate the climate crisis is happening is it's very unlikely there will be one catastrophic event. It's more that we'll have to have 20 catastrophic events in 20 different. (laughs) That's like we just saw in in. I mean, that's catastrophic for Mayfield. Yeah. It's over in Mayfield. They didn't have to wait 10 years. Yeah. And I think the 10 years is more uh, the timeline for how how long we have to switch to a different way of fueling ourselves. I mean, I but- don't even think we have that much time. Who says 10 years? Like that. Uh, <laughs> I know science, you know, people who study, but it it certainly seems like. It's not like we're going to get to 10 years and if we fix it before then, this is all just going to turn back. We still have all of this, these emissions like in the tank, all of this melting that's still going to happen, all of this heating that's still going to happen. So we are racing, you know, up the hill of hell to the pinnacle. We're not halfway there yet. And even if we decide to go back down, we still have to go kind of over the top in order to get there. So that's the most depressing part, if you ask me, it's like. Uh, there is a lot of nothing that we can do. I mean, we can turn back the hands of time, but not fast enough to not have to have other towns go through the same kinds of tragedy that we saw in the Midwest just two days ago or whatever. Well, and it's, it's a very interesting question, right? I mean, how, I think that there are a lot of things we can do as individuals that, make us feel more empowered about the future we're facing, no matter what that looks like. But obviously I can't blame anyone for feeling bleak or despairing in the face of the way people are governing, given that we've had roughly the same information we have now about our changing ecosystem for 30 years. And a lot of people have written about that, about the fact that what makes the climate crisis so tragic is that this isn't something we just learned about. Right. This is something that we've known about in some way, shape or form since the 70s. Mm-hmm. So it begs the question, what is it going to take? I mean, I've been it? living my whole life under this idea of like knowing that this is going very poorly. Mm-hmm. I, and I'm not considered like young anymore. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm in the middle. So it's. Yeah, I'm glad. I mean, it's nice to have more people in the middle with me now in the like the zone of being able to see actually what's going on. And I do think um, that's one of the really important ways to combat a personal inner um, despair is to be around other people who do understand what's going on and to work in solidarity with those people. Because my understanding is like, you don't have to get the whole continent to agree with you. You just have to do the work and highly unusual, interesting, unexpected, positive things can happen. You know, the whole Margaret Mead quote about it only takes a small group, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Um, And there is some, there is some political research that suggests that's true, right? There is no progressive advancement in history that ever had unanimous approval, whether it was ending slavery or women's suffrage or labor advancements, in the early people still don't want that but it's you know every single every single advancement we've made as a civilization used the energy and intellect of a few dedicated people who then influenced a influenceable part of the population but it was never everybody so that's encouraging yeah <laughs> unfortunately with the climate crisis i think we're facing two of the most human impulses which is a uh, desire to believe the powerful and those who are pr- profiting off of this. There is something psychologically comforting about the idea that those with a lot of resources know something better and saner, which is like Elon we Musk. We're going to talk Elon Musk. Right. On. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We have Elon this- Musk will save us with his self-driving peanut oil car or whatever he's working on now. <laughs> I mean, if only that were true, right? <laughs> it's like, it's always everyone. Awesome. It, we just talked in the last segment about, um, 
you know, the evangelicals who are waiting for uh, Jesus to come back. And I talked about a little bit about the thousands of years of brainwashing um, of people wanting a, a savior. And even if you right. weren't brought up with that zeitgeist, it is in the air and it does color a lot of what happens in U.S. culture and U.S. politics, this idea of we're waiting for some sort of hero. It even right. happens, you know, it went in our elected politics. Bernie Sanders was the only one who, Bernie Sanders was the only one, where is my son? Mm -hmm. There it is, who spoke to it. He was like, you know, yeah, sure, I'll run for president, but it's not just me, it's us. You know, mm -hmm. it, he's not a savior. He knew he wasn't a savior. And um, he didn't want to be seen that way. He wanted to work as a group to push forward a progressive agenda. That's there is no savior coming. And I think that is a mental illness that we all need to kind of or it, it's like a. It's like a childish way of thinking that is is useful when you're a child, like you get hurt and you want your mom and then your mom comes and she makes it better, hopefully. Mm -hmm. uh, best case scenario. Well, but and now I mean, that's an, that's a childish way of thinking. Now it has to be through self empowerment, through the empowerment of the people and the population, that we will both be able to survive this um, personally. Because you know, anxiety and depression can lead to suicides. You see the number of suicides in young girls going up. I don't know how much overlap that is. It's been blamed on the pandemic, but I don't know really how much overlap that is with like, well, even when the pandemic ends, I can't have a kid. You know, there. I'm not sure. I don't know, but it's possible that those two. Well, I love that you bring related. up the pandemic because it's, it's a really interesting thing. I think there was this brief moment over the past, you know, the 20th century wasn't exactly a walk in the park either. We had, you know, we had incredibly devastating world wars. We had nuclear scares and, you know, so catastrophe is in, to some extent the human experience, but What's different now is I think a couple of things. We're being pummeled with this information all the time. And then there's a sense of hopelessness that, again, these very dedicated medical professionals found in their findings that young people are feeling othered by they're feeling gaslit. They're being exposed constantly to the state of the world and to knowing what's happening and what it means that the planet is gradually warming, what that means for you know, certain populations and their ability to survive. And yet they're being told by their governments, oh, it'll be fine. It'll work out. And I am sure also by their parents, they found that when they brought this up with adults, a lot of young people feel incredibly dismissed, which only exacerbates the anxiety they feel. And yeah. again, I, I don't think that's unfounded anxiety no. at all. No, absolutely not. Yet these people here have taken that, that you see in the image, you know, have taken that anxiety and put it to good use. Like if it's left, if your feelings of anxiety and depression um, and being unheard are left unchecked, um, you can spiral down into some really deep states of um, discomfort and dis-ease uh, that the pharmaceutical industry would love to throw a pill at you and make you you know, feel better. I'm not saying don't take it if you, you know, if you need it. Absolutely. If you can't function fine. But um, I think it is a solidarity that we felt at Occupy, the solidarity that we feel when we're on meetings at ACT TV, when we're, you know, when we're trying to, when you're working with others who are trying to forward a, a you know, a humane agenda, even if there's a disagreement on particular policy issue, et cetera, when you're in solidarity with people who understand and, you know, who, who are, are in the same book, maybe not on the exact same page, but in the same book, the last segment, some of the people were in the Bible book and some of the people were in the science book, but as you know, then you will start to feel connected and you will start to feel like the days that you are, that you are gift given that you do have, even if it all comes to a big end and, however many years, um, were well spent. You know, that's, that's my thing. I'm always like, well, did, did we spend the day well? This right. Day? No, I think that's very true. I mean, because again, you know, the one, the one hopeful thing I think is that when I was a teenager reading about these things, I definitely felt a lot of the despair being addressed in these studies, but it wasn't being 
spoken about in as mainstream a way as it is now, which I do think is a source of hope, right? We, you know, the fact that we're now seeing this as a hot button issue, no pun intended, is maybe, maybe we are getting to a point where something will be done, right? Because these changes, these political shifts in political winds aren't necessarily predictable. And it's really, it's, it's a very difficult thing to watch the way things have gone. But hope doesn't always come from expected places, you know, things can get better. And there is a lot of organizing power around the climate and around a lot of other really important moral issues that wasn't there even just five years ago. So hopefully this new generation of voters and organizers is the hope, even if they're not feeling terribly hopeful right now. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Jocelyn? How do you feel? I mean, you're involved, uh, you're involved in like movement politics. You know, it's hard to not see all these incredible leaders and, and feel, feel good about the people that are, are our future leaders of this country. There are obviously a lot of things to be hopeless about right now. I mean, our government was literally invaded by people carrying tiki torches uh, earlier in the year. But I also think there's a lot to be... <laughs> this excited. invasion brought to you by Tiki. The <laughs> right? All chosen first by right-wing fascists. <laughs> I also think about what Tiki Torch uh, marketing team must think about that. It must Every be. time they're probably like, ah! Oh! <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, no, but I, well, I maybe think... Maybe it sells more torches. I mean, I don't know who these people are. They could be right-wingers. Anyway. But these young people have really succeeded in using their this the new information that they have access or not, it's not new information but the new information sharing that we have the internet social media all right let me tell you a story i was born before sorry to cut you off but yes the internet i was i was born before um there were cell phones <laughs> available to children and to even adults um and then cell phones were like big and they were for doctors who had emergence that's it and you're like wow important people now everyone has it. When I was, I knew about this stuff when I was young and somehow I wandered into a um, organic food store because they were still like mom and pop owned natural food stores. Natural foods did not mean whole foods expensive. Natural foods meant like some lady makes quinoa salad. What's quinoa? You know what I mean? <laughs> I don't know. So I worked there and on that shelf, you know, was um, Diet for a New America. David Robbins, do you know him? David Robbins? No. He's from like, maybe, yeah, David Robbins. He 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 was from the Baskin Robbins ice cream family fortune and he wrote a oh, book. Oh, okay, yeah, cool. Really amazing book. There's a second one too. It was about vegetarianism and, you know, um, cows and animal cruelty and climate change and the agro business nobody knew anything about any of this and I'm like it wasn't a very busy store so I had a lot of time to read the books and I read that and you know I, I turned into a vegetarian and then I go home to my Italian family and they're like what are you not gonna eat to the meatballs uh, what's the matter with you okay have some turkey and I'm like well that's me too you know <laughs> they're like we don't understand you know they just really didn't understand why I would do such a thing. They also didn't understand why I wouldn't want to live in a big city. I did New York city for years and years, but you know why I enjoyed being out in nature. It was just this whole mentality of that was completely different where wealth was in cities. And that's where you go because you need to pull yourself up from agrarian background. That is, that's where I came from. And now I'm like, gee, I'd love to have my own farm. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> can I have my own cow? You know, it's, it's, it's a whole different thing. And there was zero understanding of why anyone would do this. It was just like the leftover hippies and a few, you know, in the eighties, we showed a picture earlier of Reagan. There were, it was all like dynasty and get a new car and Motley Crue yeah. and girls on the back of a girls, girls, girls on the back of a motorcycle MTV. It wasn't like, the propaganda machine had crushed all the beautiful shoots of um, the movement that sprung up 
in the 70s. Not all of them, because, you know, there were those of us who continued to pick it up and go. But if you're watching and you're young and you feel alone, whew, you have way more people together than I did. And hopefully, you know, I'm going to live past 10 years too. So those of us in this age bracket are also equally concerned. <laughs> Yes, I've had more time than you, but it was lonely time with everyone watching MTV and no one really caring. You'd have to like move to Colorado, which is one thing that I did do to see, you know, you'd move to Boulder because that's where all the hippies were going. And then when you got there, you realized um, the oil companies were going to come within a decade and it was not going to be what it once was. So yeah, it's tough. It is tough. And uh, it's, you know, I, it is going to be very interesting to see what happens over the next couple of years as we head towards midterms and to see what comes out of Washington next. But I think regardless, the very good news is that we have a generation of young people who this is forefront to their sense of purpose and identity and community. And, you know, I mean, <laughs> it, I would love to be I would love to be governed by this generation. <laughs> they seem pretty great. Yeah, I hope so too. John Carlo, any um, we have uh, just a minute left. Any good comments we we should read aloud? I'm sure there's comments, but um, I appreciate everyone who's watching, putting their comments in the chat, and sharing us. And I hope you enjoyed. Um, I hope what we brought to you was was hopeful and and just to underscore that we understand and that people do understand that, um, you know, you're being anxious, anyone's being anxious over the climate is, well, it's adaptive, you know? Yeah. But yeah. what I've been told is prepare to the best of your ability. You don't have to dig out a storm shelter in the backyard. It's not going to help you anyway. Um, you know, maybe one time, but we're all kind of in this together at some point, you know? Just prepare and then live your day. Don't go back to the mall, live your day. Hey, John Carlo. Hey, hey John Carlo, come back. <laughs> that was a flash of John Carlo. That was, uh, no, I, I came in to, to read some comments and the camera came on and I was like, ah, I'm, you I'm can intruding. come back on here. I'm yeah. intruding. No, I'm, I'm here. You know, we're, we're, we're I, I don't, I don't fit in the screen. It's only, it's only room for the two of you. Uh, um, okay, go ahead. What do we have? We have, <laughs> we have? we have a ton. It's been, chat's been popping today. Rebecca <laughs> earlier, uh, you know, a friend of ours uh, said, a couple 30 minutes ago getting backtracking a bit we should definitely believe environmentalists over the bible like not even a question the bible says animals and bushes talk uh john was in a whale for days and jesus was dead and then came back to life and then she follows up with an emphatic the bible says a lot of weird bleep so that, that was that's been my favorite comment other people's you know nicole dickens has been great in chat today just really kind of commenting on a lot of stuff sharing you know her experience on uh, uh, a lot of people saying that you're doing a good job, Daryl Hayward. Uh, was, Thank you. Super, super Thank you positive. so much. You know, we're launching this thing. I've changed. If you've been watching for a while, you know that the we changed a little bit of the. You know, we changed the content a little bit. We changed it to a more conversational, less like here's the news. Da, 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 da. We know you're getting that somewhere else, and we know people are kind of hungry for. Um, what do we call this, Jocelyn? There, you know. It's kind of like we're here, even though we're across the camera from you, across the internet from you, and we're here and we do understand. So if you're young and watching this, excellent. And if you're just a person of conscience and, and this is helpful to you, uh, we hope so. Um, Jocelyn and I both come from, um, well, Jocelyn has a very good heart and I, you know, and so I'm thrilled that you're on here and you, you have a very good eye for what's going on. I do suggest everyone follow Jocelyn on Facebook because the comments <laughs> that she makes about, about, you know, living in current times and um, dating and relationships. When's the book coming out? You got to get cracking. Good question. <laughs> for real. So Jocelyn McCurdy Heats on Facebook. Um, I'm Juliana Forlano on Twitter occasionally. <laughs> I sometimes tweet things. I don't know. I make this show. That's what I do for free, for social media. Thanks, everybody, for watching. I appreciate it. You're watching Act Now. We are on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 2 p.m. Set your calendars. Set your clocks. Oh, bye, Jocelyn. We'll see oh, you wait. later. <laughs> She's out. <laughs> there she is. Bye. Thanks. Thanks again. This Thursday, we're going to be talking about AI and Elon Musk and how he's like 
Time Magazine Man of the Year. And uh, I'm going to be looking into it over the next couple of days. So if you have comments about that and links and stuff you want to shoot at me, go ahead and do it. I'm Juliana Forlano at Twitter. You can find, you know, Act TV has a bunch of great shows. we got the Ben Dixon Show. Uh, we have stuff all over YouTube. We have a healthcare um, show that's on on Mondays. So wherever you're watching, um, keep checking us out. And I do thank you so much. Have a great next two days and I will see you on Thursday.